Phillips Arena. The Atlanta Hawks have been staying true to Atlanta for Black History Month, and today I have a special guest with me who goes by the name of Claude Johnson, who's going to educate us a little bit on the, on the history of not basketball, but African-American basketball as well. Now, I understand you do things with the Black Five. Can you talk to me a little bit about, about excuse me, exactly what Black Five is? So, Black Fives refers to African-American basketball teams, the five starting players, so they called basketball teams back in the old, old, old days, fives. And before about 1950, when the NBA hired its first black players, before that, back to 1904, there were it was uh, racially segregated the game. So we decided, as we started looking at this history, the period from about 1904 to 1950 was the Black Fives era. It was when dozens of African American teams formed and they emerged and they started to flourish. And they were really great teams and really great stories. And nobody was really doing this history. So I decided to start researching it. The NBA didn't know, the Hall of Fame didn't know, the Library of Congress didn't know. And I found out you have to go to the library to look at the microfilm of the old African-American newspapers from the 1910s, 1920s, all the way up. And there were dozens of teams, and along the way I started doing this research, and it just one thing led to another, and it's become a passion. So let me ask you this then, what were some uh, similarities or differences, similarities and differences in their leagues and then the a, a, uh, ABA league and then today's a, uh, NBA league? Well, so back then there was no league, it was just a bunch of independent teams. Okay. They, they were sponsored by churches or by what they used to call the colored YMCA, which was the racially segregated YMCA branch. Um, it could be social clubs, it could be athletic clubs, and all of these were community-based. So at the beginning it was all amateur. It wasn't for money, okay. it was just for the betterment of the race. And so that's one big difference of today is most players, even at the AAU level, are thinking about college scholarship or money. But back then, there was something bigger at stake. And this was even before the Harlem Renaissance period. And by creating meaningful social events where new migrants from the South, for example, could come to New York City and they're looking around and figure out how to, where are we, confused and bewildered, they could go to an event. There was music before the game, during halftime, after the game, dancing till late, past midnight. And so this was a way where Harlem, Washington DC, Pittsburgh, Chicago, and also Atlanta started to emerge as cultural centers and basketball was a big part of that. And doing your research, did you find uh, any of the players that may have participated in the Black Five who have played in the uh, a ABA or NBA, or you know maybe their relatives? You know they might have been to say LeBron might have had a great great grandfather. Right, right, you know, right. who, you know, who was I'd a member like of the Black Five. I'd like to find that out. There's a there's a guy named Henry Louis Gates, you know, with Harvard, and he does that ancestry uh, research. And it would be, be wonderful to find out if there's any current NBA players who somehow had. Um, descendants or I mean ancestors you know that are descendants of this era and um, there's one guy who thinks it might be possible we, we talked to Chris Paul okay. and he said that in his family the Oliver name is prominent and so because we were talking to him about this guy named Hudson Oliver who's a candidate for the Basketball Hall of Fame he won four what they call colored basketball world championships in the early 1910s he was the best player of his time he won that with three different teams one of them was Howard University and while he was at Howard he was going to medical school and became a physician so Fox Sports Net and some other people you know they did these shout outs and Chris Paul said hey, I think there's a um, I think Oliver is in our, in our family name so I haven't been able to follow up with him but those are some ideas like that you know what happened now the Atlanta Hawks as we gave mentioned through they're very tight knit with the community here in Atlanta yeah. what was it about the Atlanta Hawks and, and today's NBA that wanted you to actually get with the Hawks and with the NBA and spread the message yeah. of the Black Five yeah so you asked who were some of the players unfortunately very few of those players from that era made it into the NBA the first three players was Chuck Cooper, Earl Lloyd, and, and a guy named Nat Sweetwater Clifton. Nat Clifton did play for the Wrens and for the Globetrotters, and then he spent a career, about eight years, with the Knicks. In, oh, really? Yeah. And so he was a prominent player, and he's actually in the, in the Basketball Hall of Fame. But none of the other players from that period, other than Hank DeZoni, who was the fourth black player in the NBA, he spent five games with the Atlanta, which was really back then the St. Louis Hawks, but he quit out of frustration with racism. That, that's how bad the conditions were. So we try to use some of this history to show not only that there was a link to Atlanta, another Hall of Famer was a guy named William Pop Gates, who played for the Tri-Cities Blackhawks before the NBA, which became the St. Louis Hawks, which became the Atlanta Hawks. And both of those two gentlemen I named went to Clark. So that's what we start to talk about. And then among the HBCUs, also Morehouse had a really good team that had a 42-game winning streak in the early 1920s before they went to New York and they got uh, 
defeated by a team called the St. Christopher Club, which featured a young Paul Robeson. And they never came back to New York City, but it opened up a doorway of opportunity for the other teams like the Rens, which was the most prominent black team of that time, to come through Atlanta. So there were a lot of black teams in Atlanta by then. They didn't travel outside, but the big name uh, teams were the historically black colleges, Morris Brown, Clark, and, and Morehouse. And so think about what I said, there was an all pro black team playing Morehouse in 1940. So that's before they had all these conferences and regulations and NCAA and things like that. So time, that was one big reason why times were different back then. You were educating me to a lot right now. Yeah. Now, I want you to also educate our viewers. We were talking briefly, you know, off camera and everything, and you were talking, you were explaining to us about this basketball. You asked us, did we notice any characteristics that, you know, weren't similar to today's basketball? So just talk to me a little bit about this basketball, and you were saying it's from the 1910s, if I'm correct, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. So from the 1910s, 20s, and into the mid-1930s, basketballs had laces. And you notice on this ball, it's so old that it doesn't even have a needle hole anywhere, right? So the question is, how did they inflate this ball? They inflated it because by, by unlacing the ball, and inside there's a rubber bladder, and that rubber bladder has a little rubber hose, and you take that rubber hose and inflate it by lung, and then you fold it back over, relace it, and then bounce test it, and if it's right, you're good. But if it's not right, you have to do what? Start over again from scratch. So this was an ongoing process. And you know, before you started the game, this was really an effort that you had to, uh, you know, that you had to do. It was just part of the game, every game. How did you, how did you come across the basketball? Um, I started collecting uh, artifacts uh, of this history when I first discovered um, that there was such a thing as African-American basketball teams. And that was when I was working at the NBA in 1996. They celebrated their 50th anniversary. And they had an 800-page book that was called the NBA Encyclopedia of Basketball. And only three pages were devoted to these earlier black teams. But I knew that they had more teams that existed because Arthur Ashe, the tennis star, had written a book called A Hard Road to Glory that was all about the journey of the African-American athlete. And he listed a lot of teams in that book, but none of them were in this NBA book. So it caused me to realize, you know what? Somebody has to do this research. Somebody has to figure it out. And if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? So I went to the library, looked at the microfilm, found out that there were dozens of teams, a complete parallel universe you know, to the Negro Leagues of Baseball, but for basketball. And I began researching, documenting it. And each time that I found a team, I trademarked the name and the logo of that team so that I could one day, because I was in licensing at the league, so I knew there's some future in this, you know, in terms of whether it's merchandise or just content to make other organizations interested. And that's what makes it special that the Atlanta Hawks are involved because they're in the NBA. These earlier histories paved the way for the NBA. Some of the players were involved in those public service announcements, so I got to meet and work with and talk with Dwight Howard and Kent Bazemore and Timmy Hardaway Jr., you know. Kent Bazemore said, I already have a cap, I got a Black Fives cap already. So I was like, where'd you get it? And he was like, I don't know, I just got it, you know. So, I mean, so they're out there, you know, we're at lids.com uh, um, on our website and we have a partnership with 47 Brand, which is a, um, you know, a, a sports lifestyle uh, brand. And they make nice product. And so, you know, our motto is make history now. So it's not only take this history and make it cool with an organization like the Hawks, but also realize that the, the concept of making history, everybody wants to make history. But you don't make history someday. You make history by choice you make right now. So we're trying to teach kids that, and the life lessons, right? So that's how it ends up you know, being um, not just the history and the merchandise, but also the lessons that come from that. If people want to continue to follow up after this interview, if they want to follow up on the Black Five, if they want to learn more things, follow, find out what you guys have going on, how would they go about doing so? Well, we have a website that's extensive. Hundreds of articles about all these teams, all these histories, all these milestones, all these players, the contributors, the venues, and it's at blackfives.org. So, F-I-V-E-S dot O-R-G. Or you can just Google the term Black Fives and you'll come to all these listings for us. And if you want to, you can join our mailing list because we have an email list where where you can get updates and news and new articles. And if you're so inclined, you can also make a contribution of any size, whatever size, we're gonna consider it really generous to help sustain our efforts. 
Once again, why don't you let our viewers know where they can contact you uh, via social media, where they can uh, contact the Black Fives as well. Uh, social media is always, you know, forward slash Black Fives. So Pinterest, Black Fives. Uh, Instagram, forward slash Black Fives. Twitter, at Black Fives. Uh, Facebook, slash Black Fives. A wonderful lesson here in Black History Month. Just think, guys. This basketball has come a long way. It's 2017. This basketball has been around since... 19, 10 Over 100 saying? years. Over 100 years. We don't yeah. even play the game with this type of ball anymore. So it's Our a lot brothers of were playing here. basketball back then. They over 100 the years ago. <laughs> it shows that we've been talented for many and many a year. Over a many century, years. right? Please stay tuned to what this gentleman has going on with Black Fives. Educate yourself. Educate your friends and family. Let them know it didn't start with the NBA. Make sure you stay tuned to Hip Hop's 1987. Follow Terrell Thomas for all your NBA and Atlanta Hawks updates. Thank you, Terrell. Oh, thank you.